Hey, Ben. I am going to be the host here with you. Wonderful. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I, I, you know, been talking about like my dad's in the ICU 23 days, 22 days now. Uh, it's been really rough. Uh, yeah. Hard to deal with anything else and be honest with you now. Sure. Uh, but yes, yeah, so that's, that's really, before that things were good, you know? Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, puts everything in perspective. It does. It, it really does. It, it, uh, Put things in perspective, kind of look at your priorities, but also, I mean, uh, this is that's my priority right now. My, my yeah, priority. of course, what it yeah. is. So, I, I gotta, you know, realize that and be all right with that. Um, which is hard at times because you, yeah, you no, work and you want to accomplish things and and help doing what you're passionate about. Yep. Um, but anyway, how, how have you been? All good. Yeah, no busy out here, but uh, no complaints. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, just just the normal weird stuff everyone else is dealing with. Austin. Well, I'm gonna give it a cup. I'm gonna wait till the the actual hour mark to start us off here. Cool. And I'll, I'll I know I, we need to set up another coalition meeting but yeah that, that's with everything else that's kind of on hold right now for me yeah no problem yeah i mean we've got stuff going on on our end but it's gonna take i mean until the public comment hearings in september like a lot of our work is kind of up in the air waiting for that those outcomes gotcha so on your stuff what what was the change that was made in the code i thought yeah um the masonry society basically is trying to delete the entire code section for adobe um not entirely out of animus but uh because of some bureaucratic things and a reference standard that it relies on so you know we sort of i think have negotiated a way to fix it but it still is going to require you know the whole plenary to approve the public comment so yeah, and I completely missed that in the, the hearings. Um, and I thought with Anthony there, he'd point that out um, back in April. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I knew it's a thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, so, so just, I, I, I know we're kind of getting into a topic. Are you planning on talking about this? Yeah, I will. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, um, so I guess I should probably just wait to anyway, <laughs> answer in your presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't have a presentation. This is okay. uh, just supposed to be a Q&A. So like, um, cool. yeah, I can, we can just, uh, you know, whatever. I can do a little preamble and then we can just see where it goes. That sounds awesome. Uh, we'll just awesome. wait the minute here and then we can get, I'll give you your intro and then give a preamble of a discussion and we'll just Kick it off from there. Cool. Okay. I'm like just staring at the clock. <laughs> just to be fair, because you know, we don't we don't want to get too far ahead of the game, but this already sounds interesting and I really have questions already. That I want to kind of go into. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's sort of, uh, yeah. Any, any quote alternative material in the building code has to face some of these issues, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's go ahead and start this. Um, and how do you pronounce your last name? I'm sorry. Lo Losher. Yeah, Losher. All right, easy enough. So Ben Losher is a pioneer town, California-based architect whose practice spans building reuse, high-performance workplace, earth and construction, and community empowerment. Losher's work in Adobe has focused on reinvigorating Adobe construction in California, practice 
participate regularly in national building code development to lower barriers to the use of sustainable materials and has authored multiple building code sections related to earth and construction. Losher is a founding principal of Losher Meacham Architects and occasional program manager for the Center for Land Use Interpretation and sits on the board of Adobe in Action, the Earth Builders Guild and the Friends of Pioneer Town, as well as being one of these origin members of this natural building coalition that we're trying to form right now. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Ben. Uh, if you want to start it off and then we'll go from there. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's really exciting to see this event. And um, although I come from, you know, the earth building side of the, um, of, uh, you know, the industry and uh, alternative, so-called alternative uh, building community. Yeah. I think there's lots of, um, um, uh, interesting, um, you know, opportunities for, you know, uh, hemp, hemp lime and, um, and earthen materials, um, as we both sort of like, um, create industries around our respective materials. So thanks again for having me. Um, I'm going to be speaking, um, today mostly about, um, the work of the earth builders guild. Um, you know, we can talk about other stuff I do if it comes up, but, um, but the Earth Builders Guild is an organization that um, I'm currently chair and president of. It's about, gosh, nearly 30 years old, um, founded in New Mexico, but it's the National Trade um, Association, 501c6 uh, nonprofit trade association for um, earth and construction. Um, so, you know, what we do is, um, is work to represent um, um, earthen construction, um, you know, professionals, building suppliers, contractors, um, you know, design professionals, architects, uh, engineers, uh, energy modelers, et cetera, you know, and their work in um, earthen construction and all kinds. So that is mostly Adobe uh, based on the work that we're doing, but um, also rammed earth, cob, um, compressed earth block. So, you know, the full, the full range of, um, earth and materials that are used in the United States. Um, a lot of our work, you know, is around code development, which, um, you've probably been hearing a bit about, um, uh, with the, the hemp industry. Um, you know, earthen Adobe is an ancient material. Rammed earth is an ancient material. Cobb is an ancient material. Like all of these things, um, all of these building technologies have existed pretty much as long as like, you know, we've had structures, um, because, uh, building with earth is, uh, you know, pretty practical. Everyone's got access to, um, earth. And in most cases, like the dirt around you can be used, um, readily for, um, construction, but one of the, you know, challenges of, um, buildings or, you know, materials that are, um, inexpensive and, um, readily available is it's hard to build an industry around them. Um, and, and when it comes to code development and, and, um, maintaining, um, uh, building code recognition for materials. If you don't have an industry, uh, it's very hard to plug into um, the way that uh, you know the building code code system works in the United States. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so you know, basically every every code cycle, you know, we're um, trying to do. Uh, minor improvements to the sections in the, the international building code and international residential code that are related to um, earth and construction. And, you know, that's a very super incremental process, but every so often something crazy happens like, like this year um, where another industry group um, um, for bureaucratic reasons decided that they needed to, um, the most expedient way to deal with their internal bureaucratic problem was to delete the code sections for Adobe that are in the IBC. So, um, I think we can, we can get into that if, uh, if this is the right time. <laughs> um, 
All right. So do you do you want to talk about that? I think that would yeah. be. Is that is that in the IBC or the IRC? IBC. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, Adobe, you know, the the IRC is sort of um, you know considered a um, an easier you know like um, that's the for for any you know so-called alternative material the IRC is the easier one to get into because um, it's not used for you know high-rise buildings and um, more complicated higher-risk occupancies that kind of stuff Adobe has been in the International Building Code since its first edition which I think was like 2000 and prior to that um, and many of the model codes like um, used for decades and decades before that, like um, Uniform Building Code and and that kind of stuff. Um, but our, you know, um, so we're in the IBC. Um, Adobe has been used, you know, for commercial buildings as well as residential um, within modern history. There's like, uh, you know, people think of Adobe as a material that, um, you know, it's like the Pueblos and like that kind of stuff, um, mission style. Um, structures, but uh, particularly here in California, there was like the 20th century had like a, a pretty wide array of uses um, for Adobe. Um, you know, the Defense Department, uh, War Department after World War II encouraged its use for um, um, housing for um, for returning veterans. Um, the company that we currently know as uh, Clear Channel Communications was then known as Foster and Kleiser. And um, in addition to making billboards, um, they were in a giant Adobe brick manufacturer. Uh, there's lots of cases in um, California of uh, you know large, large civic structures, motels, post offices, banks, and stuff being built all the way up, you know, through the 70s and 80s, really, um, out of Adobe uh, material. So, you know, that's why that's why Adobe's in the code. Um, because it, it um, up until a moment in time, was used a lot, at least regionally. Um, so, you know, um, we get to today, <clears throat> things are, um, <laughs> yeah, the, the issue that we're having is that, um, you know, without an industry to, well, I should back up a little bit. The International uh, Code Council, International, you know, which is the organization that um, that administers the develop and publishes, um, um, you know, international building code and international residential code um, is um, really set up, as I mentioned before, to deal with like um, big trade organizations. And uh, part of their whole process um, involves um, evaluating you know, building materials against these, um, um, you know, testing criteria, mostly t published by ASTM, but some other ones as well. And it's like, and if you don't have an ASTM test, it's done in an accredited lab, then like basically, um, you know, like you can't make any claims about the performance of your material in, um, in at least that IRC or IBC setting. So all that stuff costs a ton of money. Uh, these materials labs are really cool. Um, you know, like they do, you know, they've got like uh, walls of fire that, um, you know, the, the um, um, you know, the materials are subjected to for um, fire resistance and flame spread. And, um, you know, there's mechanical tests for compression and all these sort of things like, but, you know, for, for simple old Adobe, um, you know, like getting all these tests done um is expensive and um you know there's also like a fair amount of variability in earthen materials which makes uh repeatability and predictability a little harder than it is for some materials like uh, concrete um anyhow so where we get today you know our current battle um is uh it's a friendly battle i hope i think um you know is um uh, being waged in the IBC uh, adoption process. This cycle, the Masonry Society, which is an outfit that publishes a reference standard that's used for the structural design of, um, of Adobe, decided that they needed to get rid of an appendix that uh, our code section relies upon. 
Um, so um, they could have done it a number of different ways, but I think they took the shortest path, which is just like deleting, trying to delete the um, Adobe section, which is IBC 2109, um, entirely out of the code. Um, and um, this wasn't entirely surprising, but um, um, you know, certainly, certainly frustrating. So where we are now with that is uh, we've submitted public comments that are going to be heard in Louisville and uh, um, voted on by you know a whole bunch of like hundreds and hundreds of uh, building officials that uh, review these things in order to modify the section, get rid of the reference standard. Um, um, and or in, rather incorporate uh, reference to a previous version that they're not getting rid of. And then hopefully uh, that will satisfy both the folks that are on the, the Masonry Society side, as well as, uh, you know, allowing the Adobe to stay in the code, which is super important. Okay, so it sounds to me that what's happening and just, I'm just going to spit this back at you, is they want to modify their internal document to their association you reference that document so there yep. be a conflict so to simplify things are like okay let's just get rid of that whole reference which is the cop section and yep. you're saying no why don't you just say we reference this dated version exactly document, and we can all move forward in a peaceful world yeah um, i understand well, well let's I understand that. Now let's let's talk about the complications of the the public uh, comment period and how yeah. that vote structures and how difficult this actually is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the mechanics of this, I mean, it's pretty. The the ICC process is just wild because it's super formal. I mean, um, I've never participated in like. Um, you know, rulemaking like at the United Nations or something, but this, it's sort of how I imagine it going. It's like, um, it's very methodical and there's all these steps and like um, sort of parliamentary procedures for how these things get heard. What, yeah, so um, the, the genesis of this thing, the, the overall process is, I may get this a little bit wrong, um, but, um, you know, each code cycle, someone makes a proposal to um, to amend or change the um, the codes. That um, goes to these committee action hearings, where there's um, um, testimony in front of twelve or fourteen subject matter experts. Um, you know, both for and against for each of these proposals. Um, the committee then makes a recommendation where basically they will say like, yep, yeah, sure, um, we'll approve it or no, we don't want to approve uh, the proposal. That then, um, if it's unchallenged, goes on to a consent, consent agenda and then like later in the year, we'll just like, that will become the, um, the action that um, gets incorporated into the code. Um, so what, you know, uh, in our case, um that's what occurred the the committee approved the masonry society's proposal um but now the step after that is that any member of the public you know don't have don't have to be representing a trade association or um, um you know or business or anything else can uh, make a public comment on any of those approvals to modify change them overturn them whatever so that's like that's where we are right now all of that stuff then goes in this case to um, a nearly two-week um, conference in louisville kentucky um, where the whole thing gets heard all over again so we get to make our case like why um, the proposal should be modified or you know um, obliterated other people will testify in support or opposition, and then um, and then the voting members of um, this uh, IBC group will decide collectively, you know, whether it is uh, whether to accept our modifications or not. And if they accept our modifications, then our thing goes on to the consent um, agenda. 
later. And if it's uh, denied, then the original proposal will go through. And from my understanding, that, that requires two thirds yeah. majority. Yeah, so that, that's yeah I think that's right. Level. It um, is. It so, is. And it's like, it's, it, it's intentionally conservative, right? Um, because I think the presumption is that the folks that are on that initial um, uh, committee that reviews the proposals are the, you know, they're the experts, right? And so like their decision has significant bearing and only if there's a misunderstanding or a serious error or whatever, should that be overturned. Um, in the, you know, conventional building world, you know, it doesn't happen that much. Um, you know, by the time, you know, it gets through community action hearings, it's like relatively rare for um, big changes to happen um, under public comment. Um, for the alternative building world, it's a little different because I think there's an acknowledgement among building officials. It's like, well, you know, like uh, the folks that happen to be behind that big table uh, may not, in fact, know as much as the proponents of some of these proposals. And so, um, you know, the Adobe um, industry, um, Cobb, um, you know, straw bale folks have all like gotten kind of like giant, you know, underdog wins, like in the public comment um, hearings that uh, some people don't expect. So there's still, you know, there's there's plenty of reason to be optimistic, but we also have a lot of work to do. What What is your strategy? It sounds like you're trying to work with the masonry group um, and then, then you still got to convince two thirds of the representatives who might have no idea what cop is. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, the strategy um, on one hand, you know, we're trying to get the original uh, proposal proponents on board, you know, because if they testify uh, on our behalf, that makes a big difference. It's like, oh, yeah, gosh, you know, like um, it was not our intention to obliterate the Adobe from the code. We just had this problem. We're OK with this. Um, that should go a long way with the with the plenary. Um, the other part of it is really, um, you know, it's sort of a rhetorical exercise. You have to assume that many of the building officials that are going to be reviewing, you know, making these final decisions may not be that familiar with Adobe. Um, so we have to make a case that um, why Adobe should be in the code and why it's safe and why the, you know, this reference standard that's being depleted can be maintained in a, uh, um, you know, re uh, referring to the previous version. Is it possible for the Masonry Association to pull back their submission at this mm, point? At this point, I don't think so. I think it's like there, it was, um, um, it was their baby until the community action hearings. And I think it belongs to the world now. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, well, that's not a good situation. We definitely want to support or in any way we can, um, because that obviously sound, I mean, it sounds like a way that any group that doesn't have the money backing it that we see in the conventional building industry um, is in a difficult position. Yeah. For instance, we, we saw what happened with straw bale. So we ourselves are working to get fire testing done on structures so that we can try to claim a fire rating. Now, yeah. Strawdale just did the same thing, but apparently they didn't run enough tests is right. what the judgment was. Well, and, yeah. And so it's it's situations like that where they put the money forward, but apparently they didn't put enough money forward. And now they're gonna have to somehow put more money forward to make a stronger argument. And it it kind of just breaks down to you know, we're we're not at that level of an industry to have enough supportive background to yeah. own this sort of thing. And yeah. how do we overcome that? And how, how do we, I don't know, how is that, a, is that a conversation we need to have with the code people? Is that a conversation we need to have internally? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think there's, um, there's a, there's a few bits to it, right? So like the first thing is like, as I think the most important thing um, for so-called alternative materials is like, don't use the word, like <laughs> don't use the word alternative. It's like, oh, really, you know, like immediately that's adding a little bit of suspicion. It's like, 
um, you know, so terminology is important. Um, you know, um, I try and encourage people to like use the same terms as like the rest of the building industry uses as much as possible. And, um, you know, like sometimes, um, it's helpful to, um, uh, you know, you just need to look like a professional organization, like, like USHBA or TAG or, or whatever, having an organization, um, makes a big difference. You know, there's a whole nother level to that from like, well, okay, so are we going to show up in t-shirts or are we going to wear like, um, you know, pleated khakis with, um, you know, white Oxford shirts. I tend to go towards the other, right. You need to look as like boring and like, uh, professional as possible when you're going into these, um, into these venues. Um, and then, you know, there's also, you know, part of it, which is kind of cultural within, um, you know, natural building, um, uh, groups and folks and stuff. And it's like, um, you know, a lot of people get into, um, get into these things because, you know, they're not interested in being conventional. Right. And like, it's sort of a badge of pride. It's like, well, you know what, this is like, um, this is a material that's like, you know, significantly better for the environment and the planet and the people that occupy it and, um, and all of this kind of stuff. And so you're trying, you know, um, you're trying to create a separation between you and, um, these other, you know, building industries and at a national level, like in the building code context, not helpful, <laughs> you know, like, like you definitely like, uh, you might need to, um, you know, cross your fingers or bite your, you know, bite your lip or something like that. But um, just know that in order to be recognized by the building code, um, you know, it's, you need to play by their rules and um, just accept that that's like gravity. Don't fight it. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, don't take fights, try, try yeah. to work with other organizations when there's these disputes um, yeah. as the system. I mean, let's face it, the system, the way it's built is set up for larger groups. It is. And we're not going to be able to go in there and push anyone around, if you will. And they can do that to us, which is yeah. not fair. But, you know, that's the reason to be cooperative, put out the right image. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So we do have a question in the audience um, and we'll, we're going to step away from codes a little bit. We can jump back into it. I, I might jump back into it in a, in a minute, but. Um, I have built an Adobe structure in San Diego County designed by architect Drew Hubble, which was a double wall Adobe with a concrete slab or between the two Adobe walls. And it seemed to be a very cost intensive way to do it. Is there a way, is there anything else out there that is more cost effective? Just let you think that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I'm trying to understand the concrete slab between the two walls. If this is a double wide Adobe, so like when we talk speak about masonry, right? Like a wide is like one thickness of um, of masonry material, whether it be a brick or um, a CMU. Um, double wide means that you know you've got two of them next to each other, so like the uh, wall would be two Adobe's deep or two bricks deep or or that sort of thing. It it I think what. Um, the question is about is like how you tie those two together because structurally and yeah right. or do so, i misunderstand yeah so from my understanding it's like there was two two pieces of adobe and they poured concrete in the middle and honestly i don't know the purpose of that unless it's structural. yeah i'm um, sure it's structural yeah so um the likelihood is if if you know there were you know two adobe walls with um um you know, a space between them that was filled with concrete or some sort of cementitious material. That's probably because there was rebar and a reinforcing chase in there. Um, California, we're in a seismic zone, less so San Diego than Los Angeles or, you know, where I live in, in Pioneer Town, but all masonry structures are required to be reinforced here, um, which is not the case in like Texas or, you know, parts of New Mexico and that kind of stuff. Um, that's very conventional. Um, the, what, what's being described here, there are some other tricks. Um, we, um, 
the adobe that um, that my firm recently permitted with uh, burnt structures out from pioneer town um did not use um did not use portland cement in that chase that reinforcing chase we still had reinforcing it was threaded rod which was um post tension rather than like conventional rebar and it and the cavity was filled with light straw clay for insulation right so um, that's quite a bit cheaper than Portland cement. Um, okay. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, well, so yeah, I mean, I think that like we're in the highest, um, this, this project that I'm mentioning, um, was located in the sort of the high, highest seismic design category in California. We were able to get away with, uh, or, you know, achieve building code compliance, um, not having concrete, um, used in the, the reinforcing chase. And it sounded like you had the added benefit of an insulation. Correct. Yep. Yep. And that's a big deal. You know, Adobe, um, California energy code is very strict. Um, you know, we're required to receive, you know, get to a, a steady state, you know, our value of like R eight or 10 or something like that, which for Adobe bricks is kind of hard, although they have like lots of thermal mass and perform very well in you know climate zones like ours with um, uh, big day night temperature vari variation sort of Mediterranean climate that kind of thing it's not recognized well in the code so we're always trying to you know going through these gymnastics to try and meet the uh, um, minimum um, insulation values um, and I think you know, as far as the, the hemp community is concerned, um, you guys have an enormous opportunity with, um, you know, for collaboration with uh, earth building folks, because we have like been looking for years um, for a material that um, could be used for exterior insulation, because with like buildings that have a lot of thermal mass, you want the insulation on the outside, um, like, like in the winter, you know, you and I, like we wear our down cap coats on the outside. We don't eat them, right? They work better on the outside than on the inside. Um, vapor permeability is super important for Adobe finishes. And so, you know, conventional um, insulations that are used for exterior um, applications for Adobe, um, you know, or like rigid, you know, XPS, EPS boards, like, um, uh, various polyurethanes, like that kind of stuff. They're not like super vapor open and then also have a lot of embodied energy and thus carbon. Um, and then the other part is like, they don't, none of those things work very well with, um, with, um, you know, plaster systems, um, exterior finish systems, um, that we like to use. So, um, we're very excited to see what's happening with hemp lime insulation because I think it's going to, um, it could be revolutionary for um, earthen buildings in colder climates like northern New Mexico. All right. So you talked about something there that I, I want to dig a little bit deeper on. Um, it's the R value of yeah. earthen buildings and the R value you're credited with, which is related to the mass wall calculations that is in the building codes. Um, from my understanding, the mass wall calculations aren't really representing your material. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit why that is and what would need to change? And does it mean we need to have like sliding scale or is there a what? Yeah. So the, the, like the California building code title, um, you know, in title 24 energy code, um, just to back up a little bit, this is like really what messed up the California Adobe industry was actually the energy code. A lot of people think it's seismic. There have always been good solutions for seismic design of Adobe buildings, um, and they've gotten even more sophisticated and better like in the last 15 years. But um, energy codes have been hard because um, for most building materials that don't use a lot of mass, uh, thermal resistance is the only thing that matters, right? And that's just like, you know, if there's cold on one side of the wall, how easily does that, you know, um, get conducted, you know, or translate to cold on the inside of the wall? Um, for non-massive materials, that's tested 
what they call a steady state condition. So it's like put a hot thing on one side, put a you know temperature um, sensor on the other side, see how long it takes for the change in temperature to be reflected on the sensor side. Um, that makes enough sense, you know, and an Adobe Bricks are tested that way for sure. Um, but with thermal mass and Adobe Bricks, um, they work a little bit differently because um, the world we live in is not a steady state condition right so like um you know when we woke up this morning the temperature outside um where the sun was hitting us was different than the temperature at night you know or the temperature on the other side of the building um, where the sun wasn't hitting us we always have this sort of, sort of dynamic um we have dynamic temperature conditions just with ambient temperature changing and then we have uh, dynamic conditions with like the sun hitting building materials and like absorbing that solar uh, radiation, turning it into heat, like all that kind of stuff. And what earthen materials do is rather than just acting as resistance, um, during the hottest part of the day, you know, um, they will absorb heat and at night um, they will um, reject heat or let heat out. So it's really acting like a battery. Um, and um, that's not reflected in the testing, you know, at least it's that's recognized by most building codes and energy modeling software and that kind of stuff. It's why it works so great, you know, earthen materials work so great in the Southwest coastal, um, West Coast, like that kind of stuff. Why they're really not very good in like persistently cold areas, like, um, you know, I, although, you know, we're a trade organization. We're not encouraging anyone to build an earthen building, uninsulated earthen building in, you know, Northern Ontario or anything like that. Like uh, there's other better products um, for those kind of applications. Now, if we talk about, oh, go ahead. Um, okay, so I, I, I'm just gonna try to recenter this back. Uh, so I'll just tell you what I've heard. Yeah. And, and you can tell me if, if this is true or not, or this is your understanding is that the mass wall calculations, which the mass wall calculations in the building code are trying to do some correction for what yeah. you were just describing, yeah. were actually based on concrete. Correct. Yeah. And concrete's performance as a mass wall is much, much lower than stuff we might see in earthen. Or like for us, we, we have yeah. three thermal effects and one of them is the mass wall effect. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and then, and in California, they've tried to adjust for density a little bit, but it's still not predictive. It's like way out of line with actual measured performance. Um, and you know, how do we, how do you fix this? Well, the, the reason it hasn't been fixed is that it's complex. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll give you the example of like where it's working right now. So in New Mexico, um, there's a, uh, the energy code that's in place there has these alternative uh, compliance paths for Adobe specifically, earth and earth and walls. And um, for all, for every climate zones in 14 or 16, I can't remember climate zones in New Mexico, there are these different tables that are based on, okay, how thick is your wall? Um, does it have exterior insulation? What is the finishes on it? So then there's a you know, there's their table of effective R values. Those are further modified by the orientation of the wall and the color of the wall. Um, and, you know, so like the same wall on a Western or Southern exposure is performing, has a different effective R value than one on a Northern exposure. I mean, this is awesome because it's like, this is how it actually works, but um, you know, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> and the only way that it was able to be done was that, um, you know, there were a bunch of, um, you know, the national labs in New Mexico, Sandia and, um, and Los Alamos, they got a DOE grant, you know, like under the Carter administration to study this thing. And like all of these PhDs and, um, you know, uh, supercomputers that were designed to, you know, uh, optimize nuclear reactions and that sort of thing were actually used, you know, for uh, evaluating a sustainable building material. So, um, you know, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah, so let's, 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 that is amazing. 
the seventies. Right. But, um, you know, for us at looking at present day, you know, you were talking about a large amount of testing a large amount of complexity in how someone has to describe their building in order to get them a number that they can use. Um, this, this does not seem realistic. Is there like a realistic path? Is there a medium somewhere in there? Uh, you know, I don't know. I think it, I think the complexity is like inherent to the problem. Um, and, and the solution probably and this is not my idea, it's been suggested by people that are much brighter than I am, is that there ought to be um, some mechanism, like, like the United States government offers SBA grants, uh, various innovation grants, you know, for for-profit entities that are trying to test and develop new technologies. Um, there is no similar program for um for you know testing and development of things that are for the prop public good but don't have immediate economic potential for like an individual investor or something like that it seems like a very easy solution maybe a little bit marxist you know for our current <laughs> political climate but this is the sort of thing that could happen in europe you know and does um where um you know, laboratories are established um, either with government funding or, um, you know, through a robust, well-funded nonprofit to do this type of testing that's hard, um, you know, expensive, sophisticated, but has like enormous uh, potential for public benefit. Well, kind of going back to like what you stated about the code world, that, you know, we got to dress the part we got to walk the part to fit in maybe we need to take this marxist idea and put a capitalist hat on it like this is technology that will help grow and spur a new industry that yeah. will have wide spreading economic impact yeah. rather than having that single player um you know because if if that's what we need to do if, if what we need to do is spend i don't know i'm i can make up numbers millions of dollars let's just say millions yeah. of dollars to get this figured out so that we have accurate numbers and they can compete natural products or products that are, you know, well, I guess, well, yes, to compete in general, but this, this brought up another question in my head. Um, you, um, okay. So let, let's, let's talk about competition. Hmm. Let's talk about all natural products and we can focus on Adobe, um, but this will probably apply to everybody compared to conventional, which mostly yeah. are synthetically based. Yeah. Synthetically based, should they not also have a sliding scale or how do they get with an average? Does that have to do with consistency they can make in a factory? Yeah. Is that what that's based off of? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the they, you know, most of those materials, the um, ASTM standard for concrete block, for example, you know, there's like half a dozen, maybe more, um, you know, ASTM standards about um, about concrete blocks, which defines like, oh yeah, these are the type of sands that you can use. This is the mixture. You know, these are the stuff about sizes. Like all of that stuff gets quantified and um, and sort of recorded. And at the end of the day, you end up with like, okay, well, you know, there are, you know, many, you know, a few different grades of like cement blocks, but um, they all have like consistent qualities. Um, okay. But that is a perfect, I think a perfect example, depending on your concrete block, depending on your finish, depending yeah. on the location of the building, it will have different mass wall effects that it's yeah. taking credit for in its calculation. Yeah. Oh, sure. Would that not be then of interest to that group? Maybe maybe that's where we need to is try to increase the people who care about this topic. Yeah. Well, you know, um, maybe, you know, like I, I think that there's just um, if there's a lot of inertia in the system, right? You know, so like things that have been that are in the code um tend not to get looked at again you know like very often unless you're on the edges like 
like what what we are. And I have not heard, I don't know, like with conventional billing materials, like a huge amount of like interest in like um, opening up that, um, you know, letting the genie out of the bottle again and like sort of reevaluating it because who knows, who knows what happens <laughs> when you do that, right? Yeah, they're winning. Why do they want to change the game? Let's That's right. right. Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah, it's that, that's a tricky part. You know, we're we're having to deal with the same thing. We have greater performance than our steady state R value that yeah. gets, and it's like we can't because there's three pieces. There's the mass wall effect. There's the you know, and then there's also a hygroscopic effect that we have these yeah. three pieces that we're having to try to figure out how they all work together to get to yeah. a number, and then get people to accept that number. Um, right. So there's there's an extreme complexity there, but it, it seems like something that you know we, need, we if we can find an answer to we need to. I, I don't really know where it's at, um, but that's why we're having these discussions, and that's, that's yeah. why we talk more. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think the it's it's worth you know if we think of the lesson of like the tests that were done at Sendia and Adobe. You know, that came from politics. It wasn't like there were a bunch of scientists kicking around at, um, at Sandia that were like, you know what, this is what we think we should be working on. Um, it was one of those things where there was like a state legislator or something like that. It was like, oh, hey, you know, it's like, you know, we've got an Adobe industry. We've got this nuclear industry. Like maybe we can like, you know, um, use some you know, some general fund money in order to like get the two to work together um, for the state. And, you know, the history of the uh, straw bill code, you know, at least it's beginning in California, that wasn't like, you know, so much the result of folks who wanted to build with straw bill, um, you know, going to these hearings and, um, you know, pecking away at it from time to time. Um, but the, uh, the big impetus for the straw bill code in California was when there were these rice straw, uh, farmers in like the Sacramento river, uh, Delta, they were like having trouble with the air quality management district that didn't want them burning up their straw at the end of the season. And they're trying to find, uh, you know, a, a use for all of this, like leftover agrofiber that they didn't want. It's like, oh, well, you know what, just deploy that industry lobbyist at a few like, um, you know, assembly people and uh, state senators, and then just pass a law that says that the Building Standards Commission is going to like create uh, standards for straw bill construction so that they can sell it, you know, like kind of crazy, but um, that's how everyone else does it. <laughs> you know, like there's a lesson there. Gotcha. Um, yeah, uh, we do have a question about here about cost comparisons between plastered straw bale and hemp building. I'm not sure where the right people to answer that. Um, is it, we don't really for us are yeah. So I'm just going to leave that one. I think that's an excellent question mark, and definitely somebody that has more cross education. Um, might be able to throw out some of those numbers. Anthony, I don't know if you have, you might be one of the few people that I can think of um, if you're still in the room on the message board, but um, all right. So th there's there's a lot of work to get done, a lot, a lot of things you, you guys right now are needing to, you know, protect your place in the codes. That's a big deal. Um, you know, there are these bigger picture things, you know, I think right now, especially with the terms of, you know, zero carbon buildings and things like that being thrown around. Um, that I think like Anthony said, there's a lot more interest and it may be getting to a damn yeah. breaking point. Um, and, and maybe making allies with un well, conventional materials, but, you know, like trying to bring them somehow into an idea that this could be helpful to them, um, yeah. which it can be, um, you know, the concrete industry, um, as much as, it's competition. It is huge and they have tons of money. And yep. if we can have a conversation with them and convince them that investing in this thing, for one, cooperating with groups like ours, 
will look good PR wise, but two, this will help them compete against their bigger competitors because if yeah. they get better insulative values, suddenly that helps them competitively against the bigger insulative players, the you know, yep. wood structure, you know, this sort of thing. Yep. Um, Mandatory R values are only going to go up, you know, and uh, for, you know, every industry is struggling with it. It's changing how typical wood framing is being done. Masonry certainly has to, to you know, deal with that. And um, yeah, so I think there's an opportunity for alliances. Um, yeah, for sure. So when, when you're talking to the masonry group about, you know, hey, maybe we should we should look at this thing, maybe, maybe just see what they think about this. No, exactly. I mean, like, um, yeah, it's important to make allies, and not just friends or not just enemies, like in this process, it's easy to get into the uh, competitive stance where it's like, gosh, we're just trying to do the guy right thing. And all these people are getting in the way. You really have to work hard uh, to remember, you know, look at other people's motivations and stuff and see like where you can find middle ground and like work together. Um, it's, it's, We'll see if this actually happens, but you know the Masonry Society, which is our like adversary in a sense, like in these code hearings for Adobe, um, they also may be the ones that help us develop a standard for um, for Adobe that's more um, um, you know better recognized by the codes and like you know ultimately fixes this problem after this code cycle uh, because by the way Adobe is a it's a masonry material, like, um, like in a sense, we're, uh, we're, we're under their umbrella. Like our materials are put up by masons. They, you know, uh, it can come from aggregate mines and that kind of stuff. A lot of like the supply chain could be similar and, um, you know, as, a, as building codes, um, continue to increasingly, you know, like the, the, the background of Adobe on uh, building codes is they've always been focused on life safety, right? And like, didn't really care about much else. Zoning, there's like other rules that deal with, with other stuff. Building codes, primarily life safety. Um, but we have seen as time has gone on that, um, you know, life safety is, is direct tied to sustainability and uh, the threats of climate change are threats to life safety at the end of the day. Like, um, so I think all of us are going to see more um, interest from conventional, um, uh, from the conventional building industry, as well as like uh, codes and uh, code bodies and governments in how our materials can um, reduce carbon impact, you know, and it's going to be reflected in, in building regulation, hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, and we're happy to be working with you and your group and, you know, that that's kind of what we need to do because that, that is the way forward. Um, Saba, it's good to see you on here and, you know, you're absolutely right. It's like working together. It's what, it's what we have to do. Um, yep. uh, so Arnold, is there anything else you want to, touch on here. I, I, I think we could probably go on to some, a couple more rabbit holes, but um, you covered a lot in this period of time, I think. Yeah, no, that's great. No, oh, I, yeah. Thanks so much for um, putting together this conference. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, is there any more questions from the audience before I shut this off? Um, yeah. I, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ben. Um, I look forward to us reconvening and, and trying to figure out how to work together as multiple associations pushing natural building forward because we are an excellent option and we have to strategize and the more we can coordinate, um, um, the, the bigger we are at the table, you know, yep. uh, that's a big piece of it. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, yeah. Earth Builders Guild. Uh, so you got you got a couple other Adobe in action, the Earth Builders Guild, and Friends of Pioneer Town. Um, yeah. We do appreciate it. I, I would like to thank our sponsors again um, before we shut off this room, this session. Uh, thank you so much to ELI Environmental Living Industries. Uh, they're doing hemp processing down in Texas. They're in the process of getting their facility up and running. 
um, hemp grow, uh, National Hemp Growers Cooperative. They're building, um, basically working from the farmers on up, trying to build a cooperative. Thus, there's profit sharing from the top all the way to the bottom, and every uh, player gets um, some value and some payback so that we have uh, some equal distribution here. Um, and don't forget about the farmers. Um, and Ag Source Magazine, um, who's letting us get the word out about what we're doing. So um, thank you all so much. Um, ben, I, I will talk to you later, and I am going to leave this right everyone.